No time. Okay, the red light is blinking, which means it's go time and we're live on Facebook. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to 1455's monthly author series. If this is your first time joining one of our programs, welcome. I know you're going to enjoy yourself tonight, and I hope you'll spread the word. Um, I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455, uh, a nonprofit, and our mission actually is very simple. We love to celebrate creativity and build community from within the literary world out and connect readers and writers. And really, we're obsessed with storytelling, uh, primarily via the written word, but we also want to always acknowledge uh, artists who are doing storytelling from a variety of mediums. And an unbelievable way to see that in action is our upcoming summer festival, which is July 15th through 17th, and is going to feature over 200 speakers and writers and artists and people from all over the world, literally talking about how storytelling informs the work and art that they do. Uh, you can find out a ton more about that uh, and a lot more about all of our free programming at our site, which is 1455litarts.org. I encourage you to check that out. Um, I am delighted as always to acknowledge our friends and partners at DC's historic Potter's House. Usually we have an ambassador from that amazing organization here to say a few words. They are busy doing community building themselves tonight. So I'm gonna do my best to modestly, briefly talk about the amazing work they do and why we're so happy to always partner up with them. Um, the Potter's House is a nonprofit cafe, bookstore, and event space in the Adams Morgan District in Washington, DC. They opened their doors in 1960, and they've been a key place for deeper conversation, creative expression, and community transformation. They're also, I might add, an invaluable literary citizen. Uh, and I ask everyone joining us tonight, when you buy the books, which you're going to want to do after you hear the readings, to go to the Potter's House uh, and support independent bookstores, which 1455 endorses completely. And you can find out more about them and their mission at www.pottershousedc.org. And I will put this in the comment thread and I'll put it in the write-up, which we'll put on the 1455 blog afterwards. So speaking of books and writers and community, without further ado, I wanna talk a little bit about tonight's program. Um, when I was approached about this panel, I immediately agreed for at least two reasons. One, I'm familiar with these excellent writers, so that was a no-brainer, um, and I'm happy to showcase them. But I also think that this topic, women writing spirituality, is refreshing, timely, and very necessary. Um, I think we all would agree we've been through a year and change that has stretched us to our limits of, of sanity. Uh, we've been just buffeted by anxiety and stress, worries about our physical health, our mental health, our family's health, uh, health of our planet, et cetera. Um, and I think as we acknowledge that there's really not going to be a return to what we used to call normal, we're grappling with why in some ways that's good, in some ways that's unfortunate, but more importantly, what we're going to do about it. So for me, um, I, I, I think it's a time for reflection and soul searching. So this topic, the notion of writing about spirituality, the notion of maybe doing some soul searching and trying to engage in what I would say is a, a deeper conversation than usually we find on social media, for instance, is so welcome. So what we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna introduce each author before they read, and they're each gonna read and give some prompts, and then we'll have a Q and A. Um, so to keep things moving, I'll introduce them one at a time, but let me welcome the three uh, writers, Claire McQuarrie, Jesse Van Eerden, and Joanna Eleftherio. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in action. And at long last, uh, I will make my first introduction and step out of the way so we can hear some awesome readings. Our, our first reader this evening is Claire McQuarrie, and I will introduce her. She is the author of the poetry collection Lace Makers, which was winner of the Crab Orchard First Book Prize. Her poems have appeared in Tin House, Fugue, Poetry Northwest, Gettysburg Review, Rhino, Waxwing, and other journals. She's an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Bradley University, and you can find her online at clairemcquarrie.com. 
Claire, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Sean, so much um, for hosting this event. Thanks to 1455. Um, I also want to thank Jesse, my fellow panelists, for really putting this thing together, doing all the organizational work. Um, okay, so I'm just going to jump right into it. And so I'm going to start by reading um, two poems from Lace Makers, and then I'll move on to a new project I've been working on and read some poems from that. So I'm actually going to read the first poem and then the last poem in this book. So uh, this, this first poem, um, Votive, is, well, I love cathedrals and old churches, and I love when you go inside those little tables of votive candles where people, um, you know, light a candle to pray and meditate. And um, But I don't love um, when churches have re like replaced those candles with um, like these little bulbs, like electric bulbs that, you know, you just like put in a coin and push the button and the light comes on and it just loses its magic for me. So this poem is called Votive. The wicks are electric in the glazia San Dominique, sear of filament in glass, tiny coal, a 40 watt star, none of your cathedral glitter, clutter of light on the paving, this grid of switches, little circuit timed to 29 minutes, and after nothing whiskered with soot, no remnant but the afterburn, blue on the dark globes of your eyelids. Some things in life are not meant for such precision. The snug dovetail of your joined hands, the bent maple outside my window, a flame with leaf, its sheath of frost, flickered approximation of star, that dark voice and our reciprocal lights, trace elements and smoke, fine blue strands that rise, streak the marbled mouth of a saint. And then um, this other poem I'm going to read is also related to my love of medieval churches. Um, this is that there's a little, uh, I think it's like 13th century church outside of Oxford and they have this treacle well that supposedly has healing properties. And so pilgrims have come there for hundreds of years. Um, and still occasionally um, I used to go to the churchyard and see people um, come and take water from the well. So this is called St. Margaret's Well. When pilgrims arrive on bicycles, the lime avenue is bare as an open palm and clouds untwine their wool, pale against a pale sky. This man and woman leaning their bicycles beside the church, beside the yew tree and St. Margaret's Well, the way a thousand handprints darken stone, layer on layer, a blind woman in 1265 who drew water here and drank from the chalice of her own hands until light poured in clearly through the trees. A miller who once watered the cow that lived to the age of 64 and never stopped giving milk. All the lame and dying who crouched or knelt beside the same opening of earth. Rain begins now, water on wood, on stone and bicycles. The man pauses to watch droplets catch in the faint grooves of a headstone and wonders if miracles occur only because we believe them into being. Such an ordinary well, the woman says, and he agrees, but there is something about belief's persistence, even when myth has become only myth. The water, in any case, is sweet. They depart as they came, stitching down the avenue in measured strokes until from the churchyard they appear in miniature against a sky, the color of bone. So small, they could be sheep or stones in a field, mulberry trees to cut the wind. And then I'm going to move on to some new poems. Um, and this new project I've been working on, I would say the dominant mode, at least so far, is um, the mode of apostrophe, which is a poetry that is addressed to an absent other, um, a person, or sometimes it can be an object or an idea, like an abstract idea. So, um, and some of them are, are prayers, you know, which is also kind of this one-way 
conversation. So the first two that I'm going to read are prayers and then the last couple, if there's time, um, uh, I'll read some others that are not um, in the prayer form. Okay, so this first one <clears throat> is called, It Wasn't. Actually, I'm gonna pull it up on the screen. It wasn't a death exactly, though I've been undone by deaths the same way. To not feel I'm trying to watch a cat twitch her way across the yard, but droplets film the window screens. It's like those optical illusions, a rabbit, a woman, a rabbit. I keep seeing two things. Even without the screens, it's not much of a view. The matted lawn, scabby with rain eaten snow, sky a bleached headstone. I read about the Rohingya woman, half her face puckered with burns. She had to watch while they hacked apart her children. The men raped her, then locked her in the burning house. Against that, my own loss hardly factors. Why can't I see it that way? To make a shelter, the woman had to beg neighbors for wood and scraps of metal. Sometimes, in weakness, I think I want not to be. I should thank you for everything I haven't had to endure. Still, what to do with the feeling? Glass bell, its clapper of lead. Beneath my ribs, a star of twisted tin. It's too much. Look at this woman, you say, or at least the words arrive, turning my mind back to the article. Look at how much she's suffered. And it's obvious, I already know before I know it. Look at how she wants to live. Okay. This one's called Litany and Snow. I come dragging the sack of mistakes, cumbersome with years and myself, not, after all, very good. I come with revolving holograms in the gallery of dawn. What if, what if, what if? With my finger stuck in the book of self-pity, saving the page you already know. I come in a month of snow whose weak light deranges the senses. I come trust in indecision. With fumbling attention, I tune through the ethers. I come dumb as a latch, my hands useless to pry the doors apart. Okay, and then I'm just gonna read three more really short ones and they're from this series. So it's another um, series of apostrophe poems, but they're all um, addressed to negative emotions. And so I kind of work through how that, you know, the various images that feeling evokes for me and then also kind of think through like the etymologies of, of those words. Despair, and um, the epigraph from this one is from Kierkegaard. The cold fire in despair, this gnawing that burrows deeper and deeper in infinite self-consuming. You're the bottom of the algal well, closed, sunk in brackish sludge, sunk past any ladder's reach. You're the pitchy crawlway choked with clay, the oubliette's black throat awful nausea, blind, unblinking eye, undersea trench. I won't speak to you, for drawing near, I draw inward toward a lining of lead, the hood that awaits the noose. Hope's dead when you're in the room. You want to sever the self from itself. You want not to be. That's your deepest drive. I've known you enough to know that dive into your frozen sea is endless. You're the prayer to not and never that fears even in death, the self won't snap. Resentment. Hedge of barbs and bitter fruit, 
weed that multiplies overnight. You're all smoke, hot tar, lurid light. Where perpetual firmness, necrotic bite, did you go wrong? All your better senses have dropped away. Once you meant empathy, resemblance, word yoked to scent and all perception. Later, as figure, you meant to find one's way, as animals track a smell. Now, though felt, your seeds take root in thought. Lost, a body will cast around an unlit room, sweeping the hands ahead to touch, to sense, will pick at last a way out, trusting a wall, a draft, a gut. So, nodded noose, I might grasp you, or not. That is, I might choose. Okay, and then I'll just read one more. This one is to worry. The ragged winds incessant whirling around thin walls, the waters that rise to my neck. Muffled buzzsaw, gyroscope that's always colliding with the edge of dread. You weight my chest with stones, you whir your mill, you spin on your own icy fuel. In old English, you meant to kill by strangulation. You assail the body still. You clack at the ends of my nerves. You squeeze, you make queasy. Who can sleep in your hotel? Who through worry can add an hour to life's span? Instead, you subtract. I wake with your hands at my throat. You attack strung to real cares or not and turn my own lungs, my heart's meter against me. So um, then, thanks. Um, I thought I would share a, a writing prompt with you that is one that can um, lead it towards your own apostrophe poem. So I actually think I'm going to try to drop, um, I'll do a screen share, but I'm also going to try to drop um, a file into the chat. I don't know if everybody can access that. I'm just going to try it real quick. There it is. Worked. Okay, there, and then I'm gonna, great. Also do a screen share. There we go. Okay, so uh, I've included a more kind of detailed definition of apostrophe here, um, and then just some very specific constraints. So like in addition to addressing a poem to um, a specific thing, and I've listed, so this first list here, A, um, you kind of choose one of the following and then some other really specific constraints that I found um, for my students. And then also I do this for myself. Um, sometimes having like really specific prompts can free your creativity in a new way. Uh, so I, uh, my students will complain about it, but they always produce the best poems when they um, when I give them really detailed um, um, constraints. And I do that for myself too. I'll invent strange forms and make myself write into them. So, okay, you can um, if you want to follow this prompt, it would be you pick um, a direct address to one of the things in list A, and then include at least two options from list B, and then at least two words from list. C and see what you can come up with. And then I've also, if you have the, if you downloaded the handout, I've also included just several examples of other apostrophe poems um, on the following pages of that handout. And um, if you really want to go in depth with apostrophe, you can check out uh, Jonathan Kohler's Theory of the Lyric, and there's a great discussion of apostrophe in there. Okay. Well, I, and I would, so first of all, thank you so much, um, Claire. And if, after the event's over, when I do the write-up, which I always put on our blog, if um, anyone wants to, if you guys want to share some of the prompts with me, I can, I can make those available so people can, can check them out and we'll link it to the works and, and so forth. Um, 
wow, so much to discuss, but we've got to, we've got to keep rolling and then we will double back and, and talk about the works and, and I've got some specific questions, but that was wonderful. Um, okay, next up, uh, the ringleader who brought all of us together. So uh, once again, thank you to Jesse, who also is not new to the 1455 family. We actually did a reading here in Winchester right before uh, COVID really made itself uh, the nuisance that it would be for the next year and a half. So there's a nice kind of full circle to everyone being happy and healthy tonight. So let me introduce Jesse. Um, Jesse Van Eerden is the author of the portrait essay collection, The Long Weeping, and three novels, Glory Bound, My Radio Radio, and Call It Horses, which won the 2019, is it Dejanc? I always forget how to pronounce the, and I've known this. I think it's Dejanc. But okay. Girl might be mad that I do it wrong. I'm not sure. I mean, it's well, and every everyone in the literary world knows this imprint because it's an amazing. Uh, but it's just funny. It didn't occur to me to make sure I knew. But Dzank, Dzank, but you know, D Z A N C. It's great. Um, the 2019 Book Prize for Fiction and was released in March of 2021. Her work has appeared in Best American Spiritual Writing, Oxford American. Image, New England Review, and other magazines and anthologies. Jesse holds an MFA in nonfiction from the University of Iowa and teaches creative writing at Hollins University. You can find her online at jessevanierden.com, and I'll put that link uh, into the write up as well. Jesse, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sean. This is such a treat. And thank you to Claire and Joanna for letting me wrangle them. <laughs> um, I I'm excited about this topic and also just um, kind of humbled by the chance to get to speak to it. So I'm grateful. Um, so I'm gonna just read a really short part of the new novel and I'm really excited and grateful to Dezank <laughs> for um, collaborating with me on. They were great editors and are great editors. Um, and I'm gonna read a little bit of a, of a prologue here. I'm gonna read a, a section from this epistolary novel, so it's taking the form of a long episodic letter written by Frankie, who's our narrator. She's a restless woman in her mid-30s, and she's writing to Ruth, and Ruth is the lover of Frankie's Aunt Maeve, and Maeve uh, raised Frankie from the time she was about 16, so she's her adopted um, parent. And much of the novel tells the story of Frankie and Maeve's road trip from West Virginia, where um, Frankie grew up, to the Southwest toward Abiquiu, New Mexico, when Maeve is suffering from cancer. But sections uh, from the past lace through, and so I chose this section that is in Frankie's adolescence, mainly for its memory of a religious ritual for the purposes of tonight. Um, so it opens really briefly, kind of have the sense of the adult Frankie um, sort of cognizance in her adulthood, um, but then we slip into a memory. And any other context you need to know is that Clay is Frankie's husband, Clay Good, head of a gospel band, the Good News Band. And the marriage they have is a pretty lethargic one. Um, and also we have in the memory of one named Dylan who's mentioned, and he's really uh, kind of her second self as she's growing up and becomes her first lover. So this is from Call It Horses. I am up at 3 a.m. writing you one time, Maeve said, the spring snow is so marvelous. My mind is white and bald as that, or maybe it's white as garden lime and burnt. She stood in her filthy bathrobe facing the window as I scrubbed her floor, though she hadn't asked me to. I cleaned the grime to reveal tongue fitted to groove. I used a Brillo pad and cleaned a square of floor to blondness. And what was my mind like? In the spring of our first year married, Clay's band got invited to play the Good Friday fish fry under the pavilion at Snyder's Crossing Chapel. I could easily conjure the smell of trout and crappy and catfish and tin foil and the cheap punch in styrofoam cups, the crackle of the tinny amp and Clay's new song. He said he would need to hold extra practices in the house we sat at supper, the two of us, with asparagus I'd cut from his mother Lottie's overgrown bed. You'll come out and hear us, he said, in a vague tone somewhere between question and statement. At the crossing, I speared asparagus at the tough stalk and bit. 
I hadn't been to the church in almost two decades, even to see the bathroom that my cousin Belinda's contractor husband, her second one, had installed. I said, last time I was there, the outhouse still stood with that prim lattice around it, like something of another century. He turned his face toward the dark rectangle of screen door and the spring night beyond it. Clay, I said, I get to hear you every practice, private concert. I don't ask for anything much, he said, and the supper glow, plate, milk, tender meat, the things that compose the comfort of supper that man and wife share routinely, warmed his oval face that turned now from the door to me. His ease so evident whenever we courted normal routine. The other wives come out to hear us, he said. I'm not the other wives, I said. He lost his ease in a soft snort. As offering, I said I'd prepare snacks for practices. He said I need you to tend to mom, and salvaging at least a feeling of the glow, a hint of it. Of course, I said. Lottie's body had started to fail. I did as he'd asked, and I attended each practice. Sometimes I sat in a kitchen chair beside Clay, strumming and singing. He sang well, and I held a plate of sweetbreads. I remembered once showing up at the fish fry, about 15 years old, in my cousin Belinda's indigo taffeta pageant dress. I arrived before my mother and dad, and the Easter glow lingered like icing in eddies of shade. I had no sweater, only a sheer organdy overlay down to the cat sleeves that were pure flutter. Belinda had won Miss Fireworks in the 4th of July pageant, and she of course had boobs, so I balled up socks to pad my training bra. There stood everyone wearing jeans and flannels, as I knew they would. They ate the battered fish and set their punch and paper plates on the big white oak tree stump and here I came in my cousin's borrowed evening wear. Dylan was there, part of a half circle of boys much older. He watched me with some amusement and allowed me as always my privacy. There were no amps then, only the acoustic. The guitar started and Aunt Miranda's wafy voice began the Good Friday hymn. Were you there when they crucified the Lord? I knew the refrain and waited for it. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. I shook, the hymn so heavy and old, and how gloriously sad, the Lord's body coming down into the good dark Friday night. I knew the older boys, finished eating, would take off for the Matlick feed parking lot in their father's trucks, and the girls would clump up at the dairy delight for shakes and would watch the boys from across the street one or two bold enough to cross over and slip into a truck cab and let things be unbuttoned. I cried listening to Miranda, her voice stronger than her stooped body. I felt my own body skin, so keen to the cold air. The earth itself seemed like God's huge body, crocuses coming up over God's chest and face and into the thick hair of rye pasture, creating new wounds each time. My yearning was real, but scattershot. The smell of Belinda's lilac body spritz I'd stolen mixed with the Wesson oiled air and my stomach churned. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Miranda finished all somber and bent. Hey Frankie, you want your trout on paper or fine china? Asked one of the boys and the people laughed. I boiled, gangly in the big dress. My nausea swelled. I looked at the big fryers and the closed cooler, holding hostage the fish yet to fry, the channel catfish and crappy. I pictured their living cells and tiny O mouths. The flashes of their faces burbled in me and sent me toward the outhouse behind the chapel, head down, watching the dresses ruffle, darken with the wet grass. I rounded the white painted lattice that hid the outhouse door then, uprighted the door latch, stepped into the darkness and vomited. Pee and vomit go down far in an outhouse, Ruth. You hear the earth swallow it and can imagine the limestone underworld, the stalactites in the throat that catch the excrement. I wiped the mucus strings with toilet paper, shut the lid and sat. 
I no longer smell the fish, only fake lilac and that fake berry of the air freshener. I hook the door's hook into its eye. I could see in the dusky light coming through the air vent, the friendly small spiders stirring in the pyramid stack of toilet paper rolls. Someone had stowed in the corner a blue cross eraser with he lives at the center where the haggard body would have hung. Dylan knocked on the door and said my name, but I didn't answer and he left me alone. I was cold and wanted his army jacket to wear. The dress gapped forward and though through the gauzy deep blue organdy, I could see my small breasts and my hard chest bone. And I thought about how one is supposed to receive the Lord who lives into the heart, right in that space with the balled up knee socks. My desire was crocus blue, a vague intensity as before, but I became aware inside the outhouse that whatever I was yearning for was something I could not have. I longed to have a Belinda-like body and the normal sweetness of the Dairy Delight girls. But more so, oddly, I had a great want for the clean smell of grass after the Easter snow, which falls so lightly you can mistake it for heavy dew. And this was, of course, right outside my door, beyond the outhouse lattice, and still I knew somehow I could not have it. I smoothed the taffeta, my ordinary adolescent craving swelled and sobered by Good Friday. I had this idea that everyone in the churchyard was opening up into larger cells as they flipped fish and poured punch by the big stump. As natural as breathing, this largeness, but I couldn't find a way to meet them in it. Why not? In the middle of everything, my longing reared its head, just like a spear of crocus up through ice and snow, and I mashed it back down to save it, or maybe to deny it. Wow. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, wow, there's so much going on there. I can't wait to lose myself in that novel. Um, call it horses, folks. The winner of the 2019 Dezank Books Prize for Fiction. Um, Thank you for reading that for us. You're welcome. And I, I do have a quick prompt, although I'm not as skilled uh, at, the, at the dropping into the chat. Claire was really slick. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will share my screen just because I have a prompt that's kind of based on what I was doing. Um, and I can send it to you after it's even like cut and pasted. So I'm so old school. Um, but I asked my friend Will Wolfett for permission for this and it, it's kind of his work uh, often resonates with mine. And uh, I called it the particulars of yearning after this kind of idea of a, um, a kind of enmeshment with the physical body of, of spiritual longing that kind of comes from an inherited uh, tradition. And just real briefly, I'm going to give you his poem and then um, a suggestion for, for writing that has helped me. And his book um, came out with Mercer, Spring Up Everlasting is quite lovely. And this one comes from kind of our similar spiritual tradition as mine. Um, the wish to take sacrament with the Red Knob Holiness Church. I'll just read it briefly. Sometimes I want to be folded, joined, folded in, taken into a body not my own, change the way grape juice from a blue mason jar and the chewed saltine cracker dissolve on the tongue, are transformed in the throat, in the guts. Sometimes I want to kneel at the plank bench inside the one-room church with insurance calendars, the nativity on the velvet, and fly swatters hanging on the wall. I want to, in the enjoyment brother Roy describes, want to untie my shoe, slip off my sock while he sets out the dish pans, while sister Gladys plugs in the coffee pot, heats water to mix with the chilly well water pumped outside. Water I like to, like I imagine God's spirit to be clear, moving free, silver bright in the deeps. While sister Myrtle arranges towels washed a hundred times, wrung out, dried on clotheslines, sun faded and raveling, coming undone. And I've always loved this passage about the foot washing um, at this holiness church. And so uh, my prompt for you is, is that somehow this speaker um, is held outside of, of religious ritual and looking in, which is a, a really important perspective, I think, to write from in longing for it, but kept at bay. Um, but the longing itself is what gives us the rich imagery. And maybe it's the divine the speaker is after. But of course, 
whatever humans long for, it's manifested in these wonderful particulars of the fly swatters on the wall and the nativity and velvet, um, a specific very earthly space that somehow is sort of the scrim behind which something spiritual pulses. Um, so I think that could be a really fruitful place to, to write from that longing for such concretions in a spiritual tradition that you or your character, if it's fiction, maybe stands outside of in some way. Um, in some in a somewhat of an exiled space, um, so I'll share that with um, with Sean later. But thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll just I'll, I'll briefly just say that um, I, I knew that this this event was going to deliver in terms of the writing and the personalities, and and of course I'm not disappointed. But I, I think it's really helpful for people who are tuning in uh, or who 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 will watch this thinking, well, spirituality and writing, what does that mean? Is it lofty and is it ephemeral? And I think everything I'm hearing tonight is so uh, evocative and sensual and it's, it's so of the earth and the senses and the physicality um, where this yearning derives from. So I, I love that this is maybe disabusing anyone of the notion that this is all kind of pointy headed, uh, you know, spiritual thought, like we're really getting into very human thoughts and concerns, which of course, I think any, any uh, thinking person would know coming into this, that is exactly what we're talking about. But I like that we're really getting um, our senses tickled with, with all this evocative writing. So I'm, I'm loving it. So let's, let's move into our, our third uh, reader, and then we'll have some discussion. But I am really excited to introduce Joanna, Joanna Eleftherio is the author of the essay collection, This Way Back. Her essays appear in Crab Orchard Review, Arts and Letters, The Common, and Sweeter Voices Still, an LGBTQ anthology from Middle America. That sounds fascinating. A contributing editor at Essay, a journal of nonfiction studies, Joanna holds a PhD from the University of Missouri and teaches at Christopher Newport University and the writing workshops in Greece. You can find her online at joannaelefterio.com. And again, I'll put all these links in the write-up. Uh, Joanna, last but certainly not least, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Sean. This is a beautiful space. I'm excited to be joining this family and tuning in to future events myself. Thank you to Jesse for bringing us together. This is just a really inspiring event. Just as you say, um, it can feel inaccessible to write the spiritual because kind of writing our thoughts and our feelings often doesn't kind of doesn't work. <laughs> and we have to get to the concrete. Um, we, we can get to the spiritual through the concrete and my prompt will, will follow suit. Um, this is my, um, my very first baby book um, out only a few months ago. It hasn't turned a year old yet. Um, and it's called This Way Back. And it has a, that has a spiritual dimension. It asks, why so many implicitly why so many religions imagine us as like past some kind of Edenic right the Judeo-Christian tradition has a concept of an Eden but many other Buddhism and many other uh, faith traditions have a sense that we need through faith to get back to some kind of better time um, so that's a layer of spirituality that's embedded in the title but on a more practical level the title is about the journey that my family took to get back to my father's homeland my father was born in Cyprus and I'm going to read you the opening of the book which is is about how he managed to get back to his homeland and be buried there and how for him that was sort of an accomplishment and I'm going to deal with that paradox and think about the rituals. Now over the course of the book um, I come out as a lesbian within the orthodox Christian faith tradition in which that's not acceptable. Um, and I have a lot of essays that uh, deal with that kind of head on and look at scripture and how um, how can, and I ask sort of, and, and I pray within the book. And I, I was thinking of reading those, but I thought that the opening would be more interesting because it deals with a rich ritual. And I just wanted to give you the background that one of the reasons I chose this um, ritual that's part of the faith is to give the readers, to, to ground the readers in the sense of why 
I wouldn't just, you know, once I realized I was gay, I wouldn't just join another faith tradition where they're more accepting because a lot of people have asked me that, you know, why would you stay in orthodoxy? And so part of what you're going to hear, although the reader coming into the book doesn't know that, um, is in order to make the rest of the book make sense. Um, is the opening uh, chapter essay of um, this way back called The Rope of Desires. And we've heard a lot about desire today as well tonight, um, because I think that's a really important part of spiritual longing, I think is something all of us think about. The Rope of Desires. The easternmost village in the Cypriot Republic's southern state, Asgata rests five miles from the island's coast and 140 miles from Beirut, which lies southeast across the sea. Mud brick houses sink into a valley. The stone church of the 12 apostles hovers over a creek bed and hills rise up all around. From their peaks, the waters of the Mediterranean or the haze above it are visible. Gullied roads cut through the underbrush of terebinth, sage and thyme and into a sparse forest of juniper, wild carob, olive and pine. When the rains come, brown hillsides turn green, poppies bloom red against this green, and then almond trees blossom. Also yellow daffodils, rock rose and spiny broom. When my father died, this green that he loved had not yet dried in the summer sun. It was April, the hills still bright, for the winter that had preceded his burial was a good one. Rains filled the dams so that after many dry years, they spilled over and long empty riverbeds bore water. After a lifetime of moving back and forth between his birthplace and America, Andreas Elefteriu made his way back and with 11 months to live, arranged a garden. Planted gardenias and roses round a new home and set near the front door, a trellis for the jasmine that would welcome summer visitors with its sweetness and at night bid them goodbye. As the funeral bells tolled and the priest said, give rest to the soul of your servant Andreas in a place of light, a place of green grass, a place of rest where there is no sorrow, the sun flooded the cemetery with light. The men were comfortable in their suits, not sweat drenched like they would be in Cyprus's late May. Yet I was warm enough in a short sleeve dress. It was the balm of warm sunshine and cool wind that my father had once assured us Cypriots enjoyed every day. The perfect temperature for a funeral. My brother and his oldest friends bore the coffin. I walked behind them with my mother and my sister to my right, a few yards to my left, walked my own old friends who had visited me there in that very place when I lived with my parents in the village. As we stood in the same church with my mother, my brother and I had attended week in and week out for a decade, listening to the same chanters and the same priest surrounded by neighbors, wearing the same clothes they always wore by people who belonged in Asgata, where Andreas was born at home, death folded itself into life. The ground he entered was the ground from which he pulled root vegetables, into which he dug irrigation ditches and on which he played soccer every Christmas with the bladder of a slaughtered pig. And when the priest scattered onto that body wheat, the wheat too had risen out of that ground. The oil poured onto my father had been pressed from olives grown in that place. The plate thrown into the grave to shatter in the coffin below, like the wheat scattered into the wind would become part of that earth again. Into the ground of our everyday lives, my father's friends and son and students dug their shovels. And out of it, they heaved the dirt of that place onto the box that bore his body. 
After that, Dino and Kathy returned to their American lives, but I stayed behind on our father's island because mine could wait until the fall semester. My fellow English instructors in the States asked for my Cypriot address and sent sympathy cards to my parents' house. I spent the summer there in their house, alone with my mother reading. My mother read theological books in English. I read theoretical books on mourning, and I pulled my father's journals from a drawer and typed their contacts up, driven, I guess, by a need for work. Sometimes I translated what I had typed into English. I typed in Greek and I typed again in English. This typing, this retyping too, was the work of mourning. I did the typing when my mother was out, not because I thought she would forbid it, but because I could not speak about my desire. For every act of grief that wasn't part of a ritual, I had only silence. There was language for what were the customary duties of the bereaved. For my desire to read and type up my father's language, I had none. First among the nameable labors of mourning was the making of koliva, a wheat-based food offered on the ninth day after the death during the memorial at church. On the eighth day, my mother and I invited friends up to the house, littered though it was with piles of my father's clothes washed and folded for donation. I'd gone to high school with Erica and we had spent a lot of time in each other's houses. When we had activities in the afternoon on a school day, I would stay at her house instead of taking the village road all the way back to Asgatha. Erica and her mother showed us how to prepare the boiled wheat and decorate it with pomegranate, aniseed, raisins, sesame seeds, and blanched almonds. They directed us to place the almonds in the shape of a cross over the wheat. After the ninth day memorial, my mother and I stood behind tables set up for this custom outside the church. And as villagers left the churchyard, they took a handful of boiled wheat and said, memory eternal. Once, as a picky teenager, I'd refused to take this handful of goliva, and the widow took hold of my arm and pulled me back. Eat for his soul. I took in my cupped palms the wheat of the dead, and I placed the undesired food inside my mouth and chewed. Under the grieving woman's gaze, I let pomegranate seeds break sweetness onto the earthy floor of smooth wheat and never refused koliva again. A few weeks after the funeral, my mother and I were once again tending to these little graveyard, the little graveyard duties. When a neighbor entered and told us not to worry about a third morning custom we'd been neglecting. The living are supposed to keep a light and oil lamp which is housed in a miniature cupboard fixed to the back of the wooden cross. The lamp is really just a glass of oil with a floating wick in it. Only pretending to veil her reproach, the neighbor said, don't worry, I've been lighting Andreas's lamp when I come to tend my mother-in-law's grave. When we thanked her but showed no remorse for our neglect, she said, you do know it has to be kept lit for the soul to go up? We assented and may have even lit the loyal lamp, but my mother is very religious and also very American. And so quite unworried about practices that like lamp lighting were not based in official Orthodox church canons. She lit it a few times during our visits. And after that, we always agreed um, that we should snuff the flame before leaving. Every summer wildfires decimate large parts of Cypress forest and the trees killed take many human lifetimes to grow back. Some days later, late at night, outside my parents' house, I reported to Erica the way the neighbor had chastised us for our neglect of my father's needs as he progressed in the afterlife. She imitated the exasperated voice my dad would probably use if he were to become stuck in the grave, unable to go up because of my mother's strict, no folklore, dogma only religious allegiance. This allegiance had frustrated him when he was alive. Growing up in Cyprus, my father was used to bending the rules of Orthodox Christian dogma and prioritizing cultural practices that sometimes reach back as far as pagan times. Erica and I were laughing when a bird whooshed from the sky, flapping large wings, waited a moment and then disappeared. What was that? Erica asked. An owl, 
I explained that I had been finding them perched on telephone wires above me while I ran, flapping before me on my long walks in the hills, more in the first weeks after his death than in the sum of all my previous several years of running in the Cypriot Hills. It's my dad, I said, and she accepted the answer. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Joanna. Wow. Um, did you have a prompt that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, well, please do. I'm, there's so much to talk about, but let's stay on course before I uh, say anything else. Great, um, I'm making sure, did I? Okay, I didn't mute myself. All right, so yeah, um, a lot of people, even though it's the beginning of the book, a lot of people have said that they remember that taste of pomegranate that I described. I didn't expect that to happen, but I figured taste seems to be important. So um, that's obviously a picture of it. And I made this up to go with the reading. One, think about a moment connected to your faith or spirituality that stands out in memory. Two, identify a taste or a smell from that moment and try to describe the source of the taste or smell, right? Not the smell itself, but like the pomegranate um, or wherever it's the smell or taste is coming from. Three, find a concrete or scientific fact about the source of taste or smell, right? Like fact about the pomegranate tree. It doesn't have to go in, right? It's just, um, anyway, copy that into a notebook by hand, ideally. Uh, find and copy a quote from scripture or other spiritual text that comes to mind after you do that um, and work with the facts about the um, source of the religious taste or religious smell. Um, leave it alone for a day and do a free write about that moment afterwards, focusing on the sensory details and weave into the narrative or the description, either the fact or the quote, if possible. And I know like a lot of uh, like the Orthodox tradition has like, um, uh, what's called uh, a lot of uh, incense and all that. But I went to a Protestant vacation Bible school when I was a kid. And I remember the fruit punch and the cookies. And like, I feel like I could still write about like my experience of um, that spiritual space just based on those cookies. They were delicious. So anything associated it doesn't have to be a ritual. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really hope that um, I'll look forward to sharing the prompts uh, in the write up. And um, I will also uh, censor myself in real time. I, I, you, you, the three of you have evoked so many kind of thoughts and questions, but I will, I will channel those into my write up of, of the event and some of my reactions. But um, the only editorial comment I'll make, which is just a total approbation, is um, all of this writing is so. Um, explicit about exploring the dichotomy or the di dichotomies uh, that I think are inherent in this type of thinking, this type of writing, you know, earth versus air, yearning versus reality, which we have to put in quotation marks, but um, flesh versus spirit, uh, all that. But I want to I want to really maximize our time, uh, what time we have left. And I want to give props again to Jesse because she's made this so easy for me. She uh, she organized it. She gave me the reading order. And she even gave me some sample questions, but there's one in particular that I, I would like to ask. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, each of you, if you'd be so kind. And um, we'll have time for a few other ones. But the first one I think is so important is what can be challenging and joyful about dialoguing with spiritual heritage in creative work? I think it suffices to say you've shown where you've told in your writing, but talk a little bit, maybe if you would, each of you about that question about uh, the, the probably myriad challenges, joys of this type of writing. And you could go in order of whoever read or, or I can start. Read. Yeah, I, um, so I think for me, I actually took, um, I, I did kind of address spiritual themes in my first book, and then I did a second book manuscript. It's not, um, it's not out there, but it, um, where I didn't really engage with those themes, because uh, I think I just really struggled to write about them for a while, um, and only now have started to return to them again. Um, but I think for me, it's partly working through my own relationship to, um, you know, the church and like the religious traditions that I was raised with. Um, I grew up in an evangelical church um, with a lot of teachings that only now seem strange to me that I have, you know, like that removed from them. And so I think for me, it's like um, I struggle um, sometimes imagining an outside reader, like imagining my audience and 
that can kind of make me freeze up. I think maybe kind of the judgment of other people or um, that might share my faith tradition, like what they would think of my work. And so actually the apostrophe mode has been great as a way to free that up because even though it's really just, um, you know, like the actual audience, of course, is the reader, but the, the pretend audience, right, the, um, is, is, you know, the thing or the idea or whatever that you're addressing the poem to. And so by focusing on that thing rather than on the reader, it kind of allowed me to um, explore some questions or kind of, I mean, sorry, like a lot, I was thinking, like, as I was reading, my like, gosh, like a lot of this is like getting pretty dark here, <laughs> but like to kind of go into those places that, um, yeah, I don't know that I um, was, it was maybe like ready to explore in some of my earlier work. So um, that, yeah, that, but I think that's still a struggle is still thinking about like, oh, who's going to read this and what are they going to think about it? And, you know, kind of, um, Thanks, Claire. I can follow up with Claire. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny, we're all such dutiful teachers. We're like, this is our plan. We're sharing our prompts. <laughs> but I think um, I think it's important to recognize spiritual writing isn't always tied to heritage. Um, I, I'm an editor for uh, nonfiction for Ors and Books, and that's a really good example of a press that you know asks, I think, the heavy spiritual questions and, and sometimes is um, you know not necessarily entrenched in specific heritage. Um, but I, I think one thing that I appreciate about, uh, I find both joyful and challenging is um, the challenge comes from the baggage people have with it. I think um, religion is one of the most wounding aspects of human beings' lives in terms of policing and restricting desire and um, Sometimes in a, you know explicit ways, like not being accepting um, of sexuality, but sometimes in really subtle messaging that can sometimes be uh, harmful because it's not articulated. Um, so I think handling or, or negotiating with woundedness, um, I think I said at one time, um, I, I still think there's a glow from a mishandled fire, you know, that there's even some of the baggage that you come with, there's still something that formed my imagination there in my fundamentalist roots in particular. Um, so I feel like that's a challenge, but it, it's it's a gift in that um, you must be tender with it and non-dogmatic. Um, and I think a joy in it is um, simply, um, I think that religion is one of the ways in which people really try to honor and, and reckon things in a sacred way and in a space that you know, it's, it's kind of sanctioned. And so people who are somewhat, you know, find it hard to, to say, I love you, or, you know, have a sort of hardness around some things, there can be a softness sometimes with religiosity that I think becomes a sort of avenue of tenderness that can kind of channel out in human relationship um, when, it's, when it's kind of cultivated. So I think that that soft space is something that I've always kind of felt drawn back to. And sometimes it's because it's very anchored in childhood. So a lot of our religious experience in our childhood sensory life um, can, I think, energize each other and kind of make things, keep things tender in our work. Wow, avenue of tenderness, that's beautifully said. Thank you for that, Jesse. That's, that's wonderful. I can hear you guys talk about this all night. Uh, Joanna, how about you? Yeah, my difficulty dovetails nicely with Jesse's because I have in my essay Cypress Pride, I have a moment where I pray, I am actually praying and I'm addressing God. And like when I first wrote that, I felt kind of embarrassed, like I would sound crazy um, to other readers, like even religious people. It was just like almost too in the way this connects, not like love is crazy, but the way that connects with what Jesse is saying is that it felt too intimate, like it, prayer is so intimate that it's almost like just as with um, talking about love and talking about sex in characters, I think there's almost, not almost, like there's a line where we're asking, when is something so interior, so private that it actually shouldn't be written about? I thought that yeah, that it was too intimate. And the other kind of the way, um, as I mentioned before, um, I am coming from a, I am writing about a sexuality that is totally, whose ex total existence is denied. 
um, by my church. And funnily enough, I just wanted to share, funnily enough, the Greek people that I've done events with, um, like Greek professional societies, and they actually like, what do you care? Something that you don't expect. So I'm saying like, also like there were things that I didn't, difficulties I didn't anticipate happen because they're like, what do you care what the church says? Um, which I didn't, it's sort of, I realized it's almost a more American um, concern with, with dogma, kind of, as I said about my mother, because the Greek people that are like, you're afraid of your family, right? But I don't get this whole, like, not wanting to trust past church dogma. It didn't make sense to them. So there were, there's always there, I realized that I, I could never anticipate what actually would be the resistance that readers would have. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, from, from reading obsessively about the craft and, and writing and, and writers take on writing, I, I suspect we'd all agree that although, you know, spiritual writing is certainly a, a gateway into, you know, deeper reflection, I think there's such a resonance with readers and other artistic types that the deeper we go and, and the more taboo or, you know, seemingly private, the more that resonates because so many people have these thoughts and, and we look to artists often to articulate and have the courage to go into some of these darker spaces and meditate on them. And what a blessing to not only meditate um, intelligently, but then to create beautiful works, which you all are demonstrating tonight that, that not only can deep thought, uh, productive thought and communal um, healing happen, but beautiful art can be created. So that, that's my take on what I'm getting tonight and, and what I get from kind of these deeper dives into, you know, the, the more ethereal as opposed to what I would sardonically say, you know, our social media soundbite every day. Um, I would love also for, for you three to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe along these lines, and this was another question Jesse provided, but um, I tee it up by saying, I think it's, it, again, it's a, thinking about gateways and going deeper. Um, most artists, or I think a lot of successful artists talk about an almost spiritual element, um, but I think that can be taken lightly. Like, you know, my, my art is my craft, but thinking really on maybe more literal terms, the relationship between spiritual practice and artistic practice and kind of the push and pull of that, um, I would imagine you all have some thoughts along those lines. Well, I mean, I guess I always think sort of of writing poetry as a spiritual practice, partly because it's so meditative um, when you really get into the flow of that. Um, but then also that there's that magical thing that can happen with inspiration, I think, in any art um, medium that you're working with, where it's like, you know, you're kind of pushing and you've got maybe ideas that you're working on with your conscious mind. And then it's like sometimes something will just be given to you. You know, it feels like from outside of yourself. Um, you know, the universe or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I, I like visual artists, I know composers, I know who talk about that in the same way. And uh, so to me, there's, you know, art kind of always, um, whether you're, um, um, you know, sort of would consider yourself a believing person or a spiritual person or not, I think it points to something greater than ourselves, like that's beyond us, that is sort of inexplicable um so yeah i mean there's some mystery i think that's inherent in in good art here here yeah I, I think this is related to the first question for me a little bit um because one of the great challenges of writing especially about spirituality is all the packaged language around it um particularly because of liturgy and because of hymnody and the culture that grows up around sacred texts like the Bible, um, like the Quran, there's something that's already formed that is so in, entrenched and in place that it's kind of like what, what new thing can be made of that. Um, and I've recently just kind of fallen in love with studying Midrash um, and the, the rabbinical study of the Bible that often interprets scripture through the gaps they're filling in stories that are hinted at but not fully um, articulated not the well-known um, passages but something that's kind of in the cracks um, so for me there's something about 
there's something important there about, for the artistic practice and the spiritual, the, the spiritual yearning that you don't accept things ready-made, like they have to be, they're kind of hard won. So you, you have to sort of disassemble packaged language and really packaged conclusions that are, you know, driven by thesis, by agenda, you know, by proselytizing. Um, I don't find really good creative writing homiletic or sermonizing in any way, except some really great stuff by Marilyn Robinson. <laughs> she, can, she can really write a damn good sermon. <laughs> but, but in general, you know, it's a lot more about peeling away the, um, the certitude. Um, and I think that comes at language level for me, discovering like how strange the most familiar thing can be. And, and for me, gosh, the, the biblical text is so familiar um, but it's it's one of those things that you can continually peel open as um, just like anything that you hold sacred that you can peer again and again. Um, so that's that's some of how those things dovetail for me. My experience brings what uh, Jesse and Claire said together. I also the first thing I was going to say was that sort of the not knowing the they say that you always have to pray as if it's your first time and I think that applies to writing you want to be in a space and it's terrifying um, that where you you feel like you've never written before because you don't know it's that this we need to have a, a almost ascetic practice of taming the secure the the part of us that wants the safety of knowledge because that blocks discovery of something new. And what we want to arrive at is the truth, which is always more uncomfortable, more unflattering, and more terrifying than what we started out before we started writing what, with the knowledge that we started with. Um, so um, spiritual practice has given me a kind of training in attention and in endure and, and in tolerating the discomfort of both the not knowing and this, I mean, not that much tolerance, like I complain a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> the space where we don't know where this is heading and we're waiting for, and it's, I guess the agency thinking about what Claire was saying, where it feels like a gift and writers who are not um, religious or spiritual at all talk about this too. You work and work and work and then it, somebody else or some other power fixes it and helps you. So it's the humility of, low, of, 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 of surrendering, surrendering to truth we didn't really wanna know and to control over the manuscript, um, the control, we have to locate the control elsewhere other than our conscious minds. That sucks. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, and I think, right, it, is it fair to say that there's almost like a double humility for an artist to be grappling with spiritual issues because you're, you're humbled on a human level, obviously. And again, religion or not, uh, humbled by the notion of we are cognizant that we're not going to be here forever and that the world is very big and will move on and has been there before us and will be there after us. But then on an artistic level, trying to put uh, these beautiful, complicated, dark, deep thoughts on the printed page is its own form of a humbling, <laughs> ceaselessly humbling process, but, but can yield beauty. Um, and, and if we open ourselves up to receiving that inspiration, I think there's, I think most of us would agree in, in this conversation and other artists, uh, whatever their personal views, um, most of us are trying to access that ineffable uh, gift whenever it comes and live a life that that is not a rare occurrence. I think that's to me is one of the mysteries of combining the practice and the craft um, is making sure that it's not a occasional visitation, but something that we can deeply respect, but open ourselves up to in an honest way. Um, the bad news is that we're already over time, which is, you know, not normally a consideration, but the good news, I think, is that for me personally, uh, and I imagine for everyone that's checking us out, what a great advertisement for the three of you and your work. It's almost like, this is a nice little appetizer. If you want more of this and who doesn't, you got to go read some of the stuff. 
So I feel very confident that by uh, being able to include the prompts, being able to include the bios in your, in your uh, three websites and links to your books via the Potter's House, there's a lot more uh, conversation that can occur between reader and, and author. But uh, I just apologize that the limitations of a schedule are cutting short what really, for me, selfishly, could be a very long conversation. So I will, I will say I thank you all for allowing the time to fly by. Um, I apologize that we don't have more time to really go deeper, but perhaps that tees up a part two, because I just think it's safe to say that we really could maybe take a deeper dive, the four of us, into really where craft intersects with spirituality and, and really, you know, go deeper into how this has impacted our writing lives and um, some key takeaways for aspiring writers or experienced writers that are trying to kind of access these things. But I do want to make sure everyone has a chance for some closing thoughts, whatever they may be. But I, I, I don't want to leave with me. I would, I would love to let everyone uh, take as much time as you want and just say, uh, hopefully to be continued, but um, closing thoughts or, or feelings are welcome. No pressure. <laughs> Claire, you're on mute if you want to jump in. Um, yeah, no, I'm trying to think of, I mean, because you're right, like this is like this conversation has opened up so much um, that I don't know, uh, like, great, like some, you know, some summing up uh, comment, but um, I don't know, Joanna, Jesse, do you have anything? I'm just really grateful and um, especially really feel inspired by, by Claire and, and Joanna, by your work and your thinking. Um, Joanna, I know much better and Claire, I'm excited to get to know you more. And Sean, I'm just always really amazed at the way you curate this space and just kind of ceaselessly. It's really a generous thing that you do. Um, so maybe we would we would join again, but um, I'm excited to check out the summer festival, especially, and um, even have a little part of it. I'm excited for that. Um, but I, I I I will say on my website there's a contact sheet, and probably all of us have that. And we really welcome questions and comments, and I'd love to talk more with anyone who's interested in this topic or other topics. Yeah, I want to add the add to the gratitude, but also tell the audience, I do like telling people that I can't see that your feelings and your thoughts matter. And something that all of us have struggled with in order to get to the place where, yes, we've published, but we've all struggled with believing that it, our work and our thoughts and our feelings deserve to be read by others or on the page. And I love to get the chance to tell other people, no, you don't have to think about how good it is. That doesn't matter. And that's something that the spiritual tradition gives us. God doesn't measure people and be like, mm, that's nine, <laughs> right? Like humility also means believing that we are good enough. Um, and humility and gratitude means that whatever gifts we have, whatever we have to say, it's enough. Um, and I'd, I'd, urge um, readers to believe that, believe that their writing is enough and deserves to be written. So go forth and write. Um, and when you get stuck, because you will, you can come to our websites. And it is, this is, a, is an endeavor that is especially personal and not everybody maybe is willing to talk about it, but now you know that Jesse and Claire and I are willing to do so. So you can feel free to hit us up with particular snags and read our work and tell us if there was something inspiring because then we'll get inspired too and it's reciprocal and, and we can keep on, keep this going. So thank you, Sean, which is exactly what you're doing. Thank you. Now, listen, thank the three of you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so inspired. I'm so grateful that, you, that you've taken the time and I, I'll just, I'll put it out there happily. Uh, 1455 is, is happy to facilitate these discussions anytime. Um, we can talk offline, but ways to connect and inspire uh, writers. You three are so obviously teachers and craftswomen um, that just comes across, but that really, it makes my job uh, that much easier because that's really what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I'm a writer myself, obviously, 
I appreciate, you know, we all need the solidarity that's not shallow. And uh, the notion that part of what building a literary community is, is encouraging um, everyone to go deeper and try harder, but also give ourselves, you know, cut ourselves some slack and, and support and encourage one another. And I think everything I've heard tonight uh, is part and parcel of, of kind of what that mission is. It's being part of a community, it's being connected to other writers, other strivers. Um, and ultimately we're also trying to connect with readers. So I thank the three of you for, for making this so manifest, like this is exactly the energy that 1455 is looking for. Um, and it's just, a, it's a tremendous honor to have the three of you read your work and share your thoughts. So I do look forward to, to more of this anytime. Thank you, Sean. The honor is ours. Thank you. You're amazing. This was amazing, Sean. All right. Well, then I will insist. I will. I will take that goodwill and say we will do this again. Not. I hope we do this again. We will do this again. But uh, the first order of business, I will do. Uh, I. Those of you watching, there will be a write up. I'll make it accessible. We'll blast it around social. But we'll have some awesome links to websites, books, resources, and prompts. And uh, let that be the first of hopefully many. Uh, fruitful conversation. So again, Jesse, Joanna, Claire, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you all for checking us out. Uh, as always, more soon and to be continued. Uh, somebody said it earlier, go forth and write. What, what more needs to be said? Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. More soon. <laughs>